Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Um, we're back with Mr. Josh Richman. Um, Josh, if you don't know, you probably many of you know him from our Friday coffee chats that we have in uh, Operational Analytics Club. He is a mainstay and an, an often giver of good advice. He is also very much available in the Slack community. So uh, anytime you want to reach out with good information about um, uh, about how to think about team leading teams and, and architecting stacks. He's a guy who will give you great, uh, great information. Josh, we're doing one question about the summer since this is summer community days. Um, what has been your favorite summer trip you've ever taken um, as, as we, you know, get into this. Ever taken. Oh man. Uh, I would say, um, there was a time we went out to Mexico. It was a good family memory. Um, I'm a, as you'll see, I'm a big fan of monkeys and, and great apes. And there happened to be a guy walking a chimpanzee on the beach, which didn't seem incredibly <laughs> ethical, but I did get to take a picture with it. And, uh, that was, that was fun. <laughs> That was that was perfect. That was one hundred percent perfect. Awesome. So we also have a poll that's going to happen uh, that's relevant to the the conversation here today. It was what was your major in undergrad? There's a handful of likely uh, answers, and then there, of course there is the other option, which I will be clicking promptly. Um, so that poll is now open, and I am going to get off the stage and, and let you take it away, Mr. Josh Frischman. Everybody, put your hands together, for Josh Frischman. Hey, everybody. Um, so yeah, happy to be here. Happy to talk, uh, about my career progression. So this is really just going to be, uh, me going through what kind of brought me to my current role in business analytics, um, and kind of analytics engineering. Um, it wasn't necessarily the space I thought I was going to wind up into at the beginning or even quite a few years back. Um, but that's where life takes you. So uh, I think one of the key things we'll get out of this is that there's always something to learn everywhere you go. And uh, the more that you you learn and realize that you enjoy and, and can build this bigger picture of skills and, um, and information, the more you can really target and, and hone in on what makes you happy and what you're good at and where you can provide value. So just to start off, uh, I'll give a little background on who I am. So uh, again, my name is Josh Richman. I live out in Chicago and even though I never thought I would, apparently I'm the, turning into the guy who shows off pictures of his kids on the first slide of a presentation. Um, but I'm a husband and father of four first. Um, also, as you saw a minute ago, I'm a balloon sculptor and a magic enthusiast. Uh, why am I giving this talk is because I'm currently the senior manager of business analytics at Flash, which is a uh, mobility, parking and mobility tech company. Um, and how did I get there? So that's what this is going to be about. Um, so I give away my answer to the poll uh, is that I studied psychology <clears throat> and uh, eventually worked in marketing and pivoted into data analytics uh, through a few experiences. So uh, that's what we'll talk about here is how exactly that process worked because I don't imagine most of you went that direction. Um, so just to go over what shows up here to, to kind of orient you, uh, give a little timeline on the top that will uh, that'll change as we go through here. And then on the right hand side, I've got a data career bank. And so this is where I'm going to put some topics on uh, what big like high level skills I feel like I got out of each of these experiences that make me the data analyst and analytics manager that I am today. Um, and help me kind of round out my data career, uh, my data career skill bank uh, and things that you can get from a variety of places that I think are of value to you as you're searching either in your current jobs or in future roles or thinking back to what you've learned in the past. Uh, so this all started in college, I suppose. Uh, so as I was going into college, I was incredibly interested in this idea of why do people make the decisions they make, uh, which I think as data people, this becomes something that uh, we think about all the time. Um, and there are a lot of approaches to doing that. So part of this was understanding how do we understand the world around us, um, right? Un understanding our environment <clears throat> is going to have a big impact into uh, how you then make a decision. So some of that's informed by memory. Some of it's informed by language. Um, 
some of it's informed by the concept of theory of mind. So theory of mind is uh, the ability to understand that other people can view the world around you and have a different perspective than you do, have a perspective that's different than yours. Um, so not everything is you-centric. And this is something that actually, uh, obviously, people are able to do, and we develop it over time. But uh, uh, some of our closest uh, animal genetic relatives, uh, such as like the great apes, uh, has been questions as to whether they actually possess something like that. This might be a unique human ability. So I was interested in kind of all these different approaches to understand how we make decisions, better understand that as people. Uh, so when I was in college, I like immediately uh, looked for research opportunities and uh, I went to my first psychology teacher in my second semester of freshman year. And uh, well, even before that, I, I was talking to a friend who is in biology, he's majoring in biology. And uh, I said, how do you get research experience in college? And he said, oh, I've heard that you can like apply to labs when you're like a junior or a senior. And then you can start off by cleaning uh, all the different vials and things in the lab. And then eventually maybe you get a little bit of experience towards like your senior year. It's like, okay, well, maybe I'll try and get started early. So I asked my professor my freshman year and uh, she said, oh, of course, we absolutely need help. Uh, just come over to the lab and we'll sign you up. I was like, well, this is amazing. I didn't expect that. Um, so uh, throughout the rest of the, my time there, um, <clears throat> I went to the University of Illinois in Champaign, by the way. I don't think I mentioned that in here. Um, I was able to participate in five different labs as an undergrad, get a lot of really uh, great hands-on experience learning how people do research, what's important, and think about the questions that they're asking. Um, and this led me, as I kind of mentioned before, to look at humans versus non-human primates. So uh, big challenges when you're trying to understand the difference between these two. So first off, how do you know what a non-speaking animal is thinking, right? Um, can't really know. So uh, you have to figure out a new way to approach understanding what's going through their minds. And it turns out that one of the common approaches is uh, to try and do experiments on human infants because infants are humans that don't speak. So if we can understand how infants are thinking by some uh, techniques that have been developed, then maybe we can apply those also to uh, animals that also don't speak and try and get a hint into how they're thinking. So that meant that I was working in a uh, lab with uh, children, and it also gave me this ability to think about, oh, maybe something that uh, I applied in this context can also work in a completely different context in order to achieve the same goals. And I think that uh, flexibility in, in thinking and using techniques from different places has helped me as well in my career. Um, so rounding out really generating a lot of curiosity and learning that there are so many questions that need to be answered and being aggressive to try and pursue those opportunities so that I could continue to learn more. Um, I went from there to grad school. Um, in grad school, I didn't actually study infants or um, chimpanzees as I thought I would. Uh, I wound up focusing on something a little bit more easy to, uh, easy to see, uh, which was um, cognitive neuroscience of memory. Um, so within there, uh, I was specifically studying how does prior information help us store and retrieve new memories? And I'm not going to get too much into the detail here of how that all works, but um, some of the things that I learned here were um, telling stories with numbers. So <clears throat> uh, there, as you read through an academic article, it's very uh, easy to get lost in the words, um, especially when they're very loaded with um, references to other articles and uh, research that you've never seen before. However, the really good articles can bring you from general knowledge about the subject to uh, some really uh, detailed knowledge about the subject pretty quickly by guiding you through some logic that's laid out by numbers and results from previous studies. And that can take you to help you reach their conclusion ahead of time and give guidance as to why they think they're researching something uh, really well. Oh, sorry, why, why they're researching uh, what they want to research and uh, why their conclusions eventually are going to make sense. Um, this is uh, being able to really condense hundreds of findings into a sim simple argument, right? Um, so as you're putting together a, a paper for 
for grad school, like a literature review, you're, you're really pulling from all these different places and you can't describe every single experiment that's done, but you can try and understand how numbers help tell that story and, and give you different uh, principles that all tie together to, to lead to a simple argument. Uh, that's been incredibly helpful as um, I've tried to tell either really complex things uh, in my current roles uh, or if, if I'm trying to really describe something that doesn't have a straight up metric that measures it, uh, but rather we find some other metrics that are kind of secondary, that are circumstantial and all tie together to help understand how our users are behaving. Um, another step is going from results to conclusions. So this is incredibly important as well in the data role, uh, being able to say how you, um, yes, you have X, Y, Z metrics that are telling you the state of the world, but that doesn't necessarily tell you what you should understand about the world based on the state. So um, uh, that, that's another skill that I think is really highly worth developing as you're speaking with more and more stakeholders. Um, and then in the data career bank, I threw in critical thinking, and, and I'll talk to this a little bit here, um, that I learned how to read articles with a critical eye. So just, it's kind of like we, we learned growing up that not everything you read on the internet is, is real and true. Uh, to an extent, that can be true with scientific papers as well. Um, doesn't mean that they're inaccurate, but if you read through someone's procedure of how they approached doing an experiment, it doesn't necessarily mean that they controlled for everything they should have, or it doesn't mean that it 100% applies to what you're looking at and what you're trying to do. Um, and maybe if they had uh, a control in a certain place or they had designed their experiment a little differently, maybe they would have gotten different results that lined up more with what you're expecting could lead to something else. So, uh, <clears throat> sorry, that was my bullet point here, but just because someone came to one conclusion doesn't mean it's the only possible one, right? Um, just because their data says one thing doesn't mean you couldn't come to this, to a different conclusion that represents the, or that's based on the exact same data points. So, uh, this is really true when it comes to working at a data organization or, or in a data role at an organization where there's a lot of data floating around and people cite numbers here and there to try and justify what they want to do. Um, it's very possible that it can justify a whole lot of different things, uh, but being able to accept that and understand that if there are more points to the story, it helps to really point you towards one conclusion uh, that can really be of assistance. Um, and that kind of talks to my last point here of, do you have enough data to tell the whole story? So, Yes, maybe you have one or two metrics that you can draw a conclusion from, but maybe if you knew a little bit more, that could uh, really tell you what's actually going on. Um, the next step was uh, a surprising one for me. So after grad school, I expected I was going to, uh, or in grad school, I expected potentially I'd be an academic and stay and be a researcher. Um, I thought that um, maybe I'd be a law consultant or a trial consultant uh, and help uh, cases where memory was at issue. I thought that uh, I might do some sort of um, survey research. I really didn't know what jobs were out there, honestly. I was coming in very naive. Um, I wound up leaving without a PhD, and I left with a master's degree. And I left uh, just after the recession hit. And so there weren't a ton of opportunities out there. And my mother-in-law found on Craigslist, an ad for a marketing specialist at a startup that was in the neighborhood we grew up in. And, I was, and they were looking for someone who didn't have marketing experience necessarily, but was willing to learn it and knew how to analyze data. So they wanted to be very data-driven. It's like, I know how to analyze data. I could do that. So um, I learned marketing on the job. And I, and I came there as the first marketing hire. Uh, this is an e-commerce startup. They're selling heating, uh, heating and cooling equipment and uh, ventilation equipment direct to homeowners, um, which was a, a pretty cool model. Um, but I had to learn marketing on the job. So what did that mean? I'm, uh, I'm learning PPC, which is pay-per-click, SEO, search engine optimization, email marketing, um, on and on and on, really taking care of everything across the board. Um, and I had a chance to get exposure to all aspects of the business. Um, oops. So... Um, because we were a relatively small startup, I think there were about 18 people, uh, 15 to 18 people when I joined, we um, all kind of had to get together and understand what was going on and how were the different cogs of this machine working. And that allowed me to get this higher level view of what's 
what it takes to make a business run and what impacts marketing that's not necessarily marketing and what does marketing impact that's not necessarily the marketing team. Um, and being able to use that information to help make decisions about what I do in my role. Um, so uh, another thing I learned was don't let perfection get in the way of progress. Um, so I came from academia where I, I was very focused on precise measurements and uh, numbers had to be exact and I'm writing a research paper. So every little detail matters. Um, when you get to a, a, a job out in the industry world, it's not necessarily always the case, uh, right? You need to move things forward. And just because you're off by um, a, like a 0.1% error for whatever reason, that shouldn't distract you from what the overall business trends are. So a great example of that is when I was uh, tracking some of our spend data initially on our digital ad campaigns. Uh, we'd see that we spent X amount of money and we made Y amount of money in, uh, in profit. And then when I'd look at our internal data, I'd see, oh, that is off by like 0.1%, like some $10 or something. And I'd get really frustrated with our vendor. Like, why is this not right? And the, <laughs> he'd constantly remind me that um, it's the, these precise arguments are not necessarily worth the time. The idea is that we're close enough to understand how the business is performing and where we should be putting our money to invest further. Um, so Huge, huge hard thing for me and I think many academics to overcome, but something that is you'll learn more about businesses and how they operate and, um, and how you move forward quickly. That's a really important skill to build, build up. Um, last, uh, I think this is the last one here is don't blindly trust vendors. Uh, is another thing I learned. So uh, this can apply to really any kind of role, but we definitely had some that would... Um, provide data sets that were either misleading or didn't match up with the things that we saw when we looked in our database at how customers were performing and transactions were happening. So uh, it forced me to learn the various aspects of my job really well. So I actually understood what to expect and what was happening, um, understand what benchmarks were, and it forced me to think critically and, and challenge the data, right? So I've talked about thinking critically before. Um, now I had to do it in a real setting. Um, and, and start to challenge that data and say what I thought made sense. Um, and then I guess the, really the last thing here was that I found acad academia plus marketing could equal conversion rate optimization. So uh, I was introduced about halfway through my time there about uh, conversion rate optimization, which is the idea of running uh, effectively A-B tests on your website or, or app in order to test out the right experience for your users to maximize the likelihood someone converts, either makes a purchase or signs up for something. Uh, and this was a perfect blend for me of my academic research skills with my newfound marketing skills. Um, so uh, we got to do experiments in the real world, which I didn't think was possible. I didn't know it was a thing. And that was amazing to me. So um, about three years in, we got acquired by a company called Power Equipment Direct which was an exciting time, uh, but they were already pretty established. Um, they were owned by an $11 billion company. They themselves were a, um, excuse me, I think at the time were something like a $100 million company, a uh, $100 million a year company. And they had like 13 niche uh, e-commerce stores and we became the 14th. They had 12 and we were the 13th. And um when I came on, they had a marketing team. They had people who were doing what I was doing. And they tried to slot me in, 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 in a marketing role, but it was kind of unclear exactly what I should be doing. And at the end of the day, it became a build your own role kind of thing. I was explicitly told at one point, figure out how you think you can provide value to the company, write up a description of how you can do that, and that's going to be your job. So I said, okay, I know that I can, uh, that I can build up uh, conversion rate optimization tests and, and drive that platform forward. Um, I really enjoy that. I'm going to try and make that my thing. Um, and so I tried to do that. But uh, I also found that just because a company is big doesn't mean that they're using data, right? So they might have tons of, uh, of dollars in revenue coming in, but they might either not be using data at all, might be using it in a different way than you'd expect, or maybe not enough. There's a lot of opportunity there. Um, and that led me down this path of building basics. So that's what I have in my career bank here. Um, uh, I think I'll get to that a little bit more in a minute. But uh, as I was talking about conversion optimization, it needs buy-in. So if someone's not 
familiar with using data to make their decisions. And you run a test like I did, or my first test there, uh, I made a change to the, the homepage of one of the uh, primary sites in, in their network. And I was honestly able to see a 10% conversion rate lift, statistically significant, would have led to millions of dollars in additional revenue, um, showed the results, got kind of, uh, oh, okay, that's nice. Like, yeah, we probably assumed that was a change we needed to make. And that was pretty much the, the, the answer I got. And when it came time to share our successes for the quarter, uh, and, and my manager went up to share them, uh, there was zero recognition of what uh, we had found. And it took this being something, uh, it took a really long time for this to actually get shown uh, or, or implemented later, even after I was gone, it didn't get implemented when I was there. Um, so you really need buy-in at the beginning. Um, so what I found is that you need to fill the hole that needs to, that needs filling. And at this company, it seemed like people did not, uh, were not using data in, in a f- complete way throughout their day. So I needed to fill the basics. So I found out that you could build dashboards in Google Analytics, and that was the low-hanging fruit. Um, and I found that the I could make things like your most popular products, your most popular search terms, things that you think would be obvious and you'd want to drive your business that weren't necessarily being surfaced uh, regularly. Um, and when I realized this is the path I wanted to go down, I wanted to be able to help businesses figure out the, the basics of how to understand their business. Um, I realized I needed some more hard skills that I didn't have, and this company wasn't really interested in supporting. So I moved on to a company called Wiseant, which is a market uh, a digital marketplace for tutors and um, students to learn new things. And I came here to learn tech skills. And before I get into what I learned, I think a really important thing here was a differentiation of my resume at this point. Um, I was told during the process, either during the process or afterwards, um, that my resume really stuck out because I wasn't coming from a statistics background or a math background. I was coming from a marketing background and a psychology background. And I also had the data skills to analyze their data. Well, this is fantastic because you can understand our business. You can talk the way that we talk. Um, you can, you can speak our language and still help us understand the data and translate it. And this was a huge win, uh, for me and it helped me get the job. Um, they're, they're very explicit about that. So, um, for those of you who feel like you might not have a background that is 100% data, 100% stats or, uh, a CS background, then, uh, don't feel left out. Don't feel like you can't do it. Uh, it's definitely a thing that that you can learn and it's a it's a, a a benefit to have this varied background um and looking at the poll um we had 14 people so far respond here and we got three other people in psychology good for you guys and 64 percent of people said other in terms of their majors meaning that no one was statistics no one was economics only one cs one information systems so it seems like a lot of people are uh following this path as well which is encouraging um so I, um, my part one, part one of my time at Wiseant was SQL and business analytics. Um, so learning this, I didn't really know SQL very well. Um, so I needed to go beyond ad hoc queries uh, and start to learn what it meant to build an ETL, what it meant to build a data model, um, and building dashboards that tell a story. So not just a dashboard of assorted metrics that, yeah, help you understand the business, but um, are just kind of random things. Uh, But really helping to say, okay, this is a product specific product centric dashboard that's going to tell us how people are using this product and lead us to some insights and um, allow us to see when behavior deviates from a certain pattern. Um, And then the second half of when I was there, I got to focus a lot on data science. So uh, it was my first real exposure to that. I had a chance to learn Python uh, on my own outside of work through a Coursera course and realized I could apply it to what I was doing. So I started to build out some tools um, and I was able to produce some pretty cool things. Uh, what I learned was that uh, you certainly can get some impressive output, but it certainly takes a long time to, to complete. And my first project for sure, it took me months to really get done. It was a lot of time to work. And what was important is that I spent months doing this project. And at the end of the day, 
I showed it to our product team and said, hey, I did this really cool thing. This is going to be amazing. I can prove to you the conversion rates are going to go up the wazoo if we implement this. And they said, oh, you didn't tell us you were working on this. We've got a whole product roadmap that we've got planned. We can't just slot this in right now. So incredibly disappointing. But it really taught me that lesson the hard way that communication is key. Um, you need to uh, make sure you're talking with your stakeholders before you dive too deep into uh, a project for them so that they know to expect it and, and that it becomes something that gets utilized in the right way. Um, that's what that line there was. And, and update people regularly as they're going through, especially if it's a months long project. You need to let people know. Um, unfortunately, I'm going to rush through this last slide because I'm running out of time. But in my current role, um, I talk a, a little bit more about how our uh, company evolved in, in a different talk that's available in the operation analytics Slack group somewhere um, and on YouTube. So you can take a look at that. Um, but uh, when I moved over to ParkWiz, uh, I moved there for a chance to manage people um, and, and grow as a data manager. And suddenly I had a lot more competing priorities. Uh, so learned a lot about how do you prioritize within a, uh, and, and across departments? How do you prioritize data-centric products, uh, projects um, so like tech debt, something you always need to be working on. But if everyone else is requesting things that have a lot more visibility, uh, it's a lot harder to shove those things in and justify them. And learned about uh, much more complex ETL and reporting systems than I had dealt with before. Um, so <clears throat> this gave me a chance to really understand when do you prioritize a bug, right? When you have this really complex system, there's always going to be bugs or business logic that changes. How do you decide when you should actually put that in? It's not such an easy thing. Um, and then it came time to build a team. So um, I have had the chance to build teams twice here. Uh, at, we had a team when I first joined and uh, that I got to build and then COVID hit and unfortunately it hit our industry pretty hard. And so uh, as COVID started to recover or we started to recover from COVID, got to build it again. Um, I think one of the things I learned is that not everyone's the same, right? Everyone brings different skills and you might have someone who's a storyteller. You might have someone who's a coder, but having all those different skill sets um, together is going to help your team um, much more. Um, that says building behind my head, uh, but building versus maintaining versus growing a team. So uh, being attentive to the pain points of your direct reports Um we can dive into this at another point, uh, but deciding whether sprints versus Kanban boards uh, makes sense for you. I know sprints particularly were a pain point for my teams in the past, so we switched to a Kanban board, which relieved a lot of stress that was unnecessary, and we still uh, became uh, incredibly productive. So uh, oh, I didn't even get to Flash. Goodness, I'm too long. Uh, <laughs> I forgot to split it up. Um, so eventually with Flash, we uh, split into multiple... We brought together a whole bunch of companies in a, in a big merger and set of acquisitions. Uh, the one thing I'll, I'll talk about here is if you give a stakeholder a chart, it's going to want 10 more, right? So you, you need to manage out. You need to make sure that you're managing expectations. Feedback loops are critical in being able to manage those expectations. Um, man, this is all the good stuff. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, being able to identify and tackle low hanging fruit to show immediate value, uh, staying transparent around how projects relate to company level goals, uh, keeping stakeholders apprised of current and upcoming projects. It goes back to the communication we talked about before, and then listening closely to the business for escalations and changes in priority. So, uh, apologize for rushing through that last slide, uh, quite a bit, but again, like Trevor said, I'm often in the, uh, Slack in the, the Slack group. So please feel free if you have any questions to pop in there and happy to answer when I can. And that's all for Josh. Let's move right up. No, just kidding. Uh, Josh, it's been a pleasure listening to you. Um, I got the, the, the results to the open or to the poll and, and not surprisingly, 65% of people had nothing to do with data or analytics. Um, and here we are. Um, and on, in addition to that, we actually found for people who uh, are with you on the on the psych train, so very very cool there. Um, I we have a few questions. I get to ask you one because otherwise I will get fired if I ask you if we take more time than that. Um, the question is, what is the and also for those of you who again to reiterate, join Josh Friday's coffee 
It's great. Um, he has given us a talk about his current data stack at um, Flash, and it was really enlightening. I think the thing for me that felt good about it was that seeing the you know, skeleton in somebody else's closet made it feel a lot better about having skeletons in my own closet. Um, but the question was, what is the most useful thing about that you learned from academia that you apply to your job today? Like, if you could just boil that down to one thing and one thing only. Yeah, if I could boil that down to one thing, it's um, being able to think critically. Well, I guess it'll be two things. Being able to think critically about uh, the the things that you're told and the information you see and not let one data point dictate your point of view. Um, that there are often a lot of data points that can come together and paint the whole picture, um, especially when you're working in a company with a whole lot of data in different departments and just kind of nitpicking one point or two points is uh, can potentially lead you down the wrong path because you're not seeing the whole picture. Yeah, I thought that was a really interesting connection to the theory of mind, which I have no idea about, but it sounds similar to kind of what you're you're mentioning there. Well, again, Josh, thank you. Uh, I hope we get a chance to talk with all of these folks. I'm sure there's uh, applause going on around the world right now for you. So thanks again. Those of you who are, are listening, um, next up is Taylor Brownlow, who works as a on product at, at Count, an analytics tool. I'm really excited to hear what she has to talk to, to, to share with us today. Um, she's also a, a very fantastic person and like really, really smart. So you should hang on and listen to that one too. Um, that will start in about a two two minutes here. And again, Josh, uh, thanks for having us on, and we'll see you on Slack. Yep. Thanks, everybody.